We welcome you to the Interfaith Council of Contra Costa County's May 12th meeting. We're so grateful that you're here. We're welcoming more siblings as uh, the hour has chimed as we come together. We are 109 congregations, monasteries, and retreat centers that do our work together around religious freedom, protecting religious minorities, and um, interfaith understanding as we do our dialogues together. As we come together, uh, uh, Rodney Lemery is our moderator this morning, and we invite you to uh, mute for the first few minutes until we continue to welcome more of our siblings. Get away, Rod. Good morning, everyone. Hi, I'm Rodney Limery. I am not Dennis <laughs> this morning. Uh, it's so nice to be with all of you again. I know some of you, many of you, from my days on the elected council, uh, but I've been on a bit of a hiatus this past year dealing with some personal issues that are all better now, and I'm back. So it's very nice to be here together. Hey, Felicity, I see you. It's very nice to, to see everyone. Um, so our first uh, order of business will be to approve the minutes from the last elected council meeting, which were sent to you via will in the previous email. Um, are there any discussion points from those meeting minutes? Anything people want to alter? Hi, Jenny. Hi. Uh, I don't think my name was on there as being a participant at the last meeting, and I thought I was there. Okay, well, I, I will be glad to add that, uh, amend the minutes for you, Jenny. Thank you. And I appreciate that you said that because I, I would like uh, everyone to uh, see if that is correct. That's one of the harder parts to get <laughs> correct. So it'd be nice to, if you have a problem, um, please let us know and we'll be glad to amend the note, uh, amend the minutes. Thank you. Other points of discussion on the meeting minutes? Can we entertain a motion to approve the meeting minutes then, please? I see Felicity has motion to approve them and David has seconded the approval. All in favor, can you give me a thumbs up or say aye? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? No opposition, then the meeting minutes have uh, been approved. Thank you all. Great. Um, our uh, land acknowledgement today will recognize that last week was the um, uh, on May 5th, President uh, Biden signed a um, uh, executive order and um, for the first time, a lot of the missing and murdered indigenous women are being um, their plight are being recognized right now, especially um, those that are being stolen near man camps and fossil fuel extraction sites. Um, around the world. Uh, this is where a lot of the indigenous women, especially in North America, seem to be being taken from. And um, and there's uh, it's been an issue for 30 years, but it took Deb Holland coming on as Secretary of the Interior to really make this an issue that our own government is, uh, is bringing about so and starting to address. So we just want to recognize that that's a reality for so many these days and that we want to be able to live into this moment um recognizing the needs of all of those as we come together next is our covenant and Ginny and susie will be reading that for us i foresee covenant in solidarity with one another we each affirm our dialogue Oops. 
because I'm trying to get rid of my um, I think you're muted now, Jenny. Can you unmute? Well, I think I've lost the uh, screen for some reason. I was trying to make the slide disappear. Oh, there it is. I've got it. I'm sorry. I lost the screen. Ready to go ahead. I can't see it. Go ahead, Susie. Thank you. Our dialogue is an interface dialogue. We all have different communication styles and varying views. We commit to be in dialogue with respect for all, expanding listening to hear multiple points of view. Responsible for the growth of I4C, and each of us shares a duty to inter interface growth. The governing board provides leadership, and the elected council work towards progress and the fulfillment of I4C goals as we grow. Let me go on. We recognize that we are imbued with interfaith responsibility. As such, we commit to hold ourselves and each other accountable to merit that trust, respect for the diverse traditions, beliefs, and spiritual paths of all those we encounter, hold ourselves to the highest ethical standards and accountability. Our shared time together is interfaith time. We commit during the start and end times of each time we meet. Thank you, Susie. If you have background noise, please mute yourself. And um, Nasli is going to give us our opening faith reflection. Hi, <clears throat> this is Nasli. I, it was our Eid recently. And uh, after Ramadan, we have two Eids. One is uh, after Ramadan, the next one is after Hajj. So in Ramadan, we have um, very different, uh, in, in, on the Eid, after Ramadan, we have different rituals. We uh, give charity, but uh, in um, the second Eid after um, Hajj, we slaughter a um, lamb or a cow and uh, give the meat to poor. But after Ramadan, we have this um, thing before uh, we go for the Eid prayers, we have to give a charity, which is mandatory for everyone. It's called uh, Fitra. So it is uh, to give charity for the people who cannot celebrate Eid. We fast for a month and it's a big festivity for us. And um, so charity is very important for Muslims. I think it's all in all faith, but uh, for us, uh, every festivities we do, we have to give charity. And uh, for me, Eid is like we fast the whole month. It has been a big uh, ritual for all of us to get together as a community. And especially here in America, we get together, We you know, this time we did a picnic and we went to the park in Walnut Creek and there were like seven Muslim groups there having a picnic, <laughs> which was really interesting. And um, so before, uh, night before Eid, we have a chant rat, like uh, we, we see the moon and then we celebrate. We put henna in our hands, we have to wear new clothes, we clean all our house, you know. We don't do it here, but that's what we did in Pakistan. We were like all the shops were open till 2, 3 a.m. Uh, during that night. And uh, we have to wear bangles and it was a big ritual. They still do it in Pakistan. So here it's okay. <laughs> so, so. It's in, it says in a Quran also that, you know, after you fast, you have done fasting, you should celebrate. So we really do big celebrations. I don't know if you have any questions. <laughs> That's it. Nasli, I do have a question. Yeah, we, yes. there's an iftar break the fast after every day during the 30 day period. Yes. And you're saying the eve is basically the last iftar. Is that is that correct? Yes, yes. And after the iftar, we just, uh, we, for us, moon sighting is important. We don't uh, celebrate it till we see the moon, the first uh, moon. 
but a lot of people have started celebrating because they say scientifically you know the we know when the moon is <laughs> there's a new moon but for us we have to see the moon before we celebrate so it's a big occasion for us we have festive we have a like we in our mosque we had a, a huge festivity called chandrat uh, so and uh, people sell clothes they sell jewelry you know people buy it. there's a henna person there there's a so it's a it's a lot of fun for kids also they love it my children don't go to the mosque that much but they love this <laughs> festivity and this celebration it sounds like it starts right at, at in sunset or after sunset yes, and yes, then it lasts yes. is it last half the night or what, what is it a long celebration it's after the iftar like late night and it stays till early morning people are very excited they do celebrations <laughs> yeah and then they're eating the whole time right <laughs> yes too much food <laughs> then uh, we have to but, go it's a prayer is mandatory especially for men so they go to the mosque they pray and uh, now the women also go we also go there because our community you know here is has changed they have uh, you know changed but in pakistan nobody goes to the mosque women don't go but here women also go then we again have a breakfast a huge breakfast there <laughs> so it is eating is i think a very essential part <laughs> i don't know a lot of food. Actually, Eid, Eid is celebrated after you sight the new moon. So it's not the last fast. It's the day after the fast. And that's what it is. Yes, yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah we, Sabra and I, we used to celebrate it uh, uh, when we were very small community. We used to be together. But now our community has expanded now we don't yeah. we can't even invite <laughs> yeah we just do it so actually beautiful. nazli actually a uh, lots of people in pakistan do go to the masjid the women do go to the masjid we've gone or we've gone for a long time when we were younger uh, and our we families still went. do in the Punjab, yeah, I know. we never but went in, Kar so in karachi people people oh, have been, okay. always been going to the masjid the women okay. have always gone to the masjid yeah Okay. So it's not. No, it's I did not, not know that. Them. We never <laughs> yeah, went. Yeah. <laughs> we never went. Yeah. We were. Uh, yeah. We so it was not that go, yeah. we, they, we were stopped. Uh, we were not allowed. We just didn't go. It was not yeah. customary yeah. to go at that time. I, I don't know. Anything else? <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I've had the pleasure of having and enjoying an Eid meal or two in my life, and they're <laughs> always amazing. So I hope other people get a chance to do the same. Moving us forward, we are really excited to hear from a person within our community uh, from the Lions Center for the Visually Impaired, uh, Richard Grange. And he will be sharing with us the work of this organization in our very own community. So thank you for being here. Thank you for um, inviting me or allowing me to be here. I appreciate that. Hey, everyone. I'm glad to be here together with you for this Interfaith Council meeting. I've never joined before. I didn't really know much about you, so I'm glad to learn. Um, I have a connection when I, I was in the ministry um, before I got into my current career with the Lions Center doing activities so uh, in San Francisco. So I appreciate all the work you're doing. I realize it's, it is a lot of work, um, important work that um, no others can do in the community. So I appreciate what you do. Our Lions Center for the Visually Impaired, we're serving seniors who are blind or visually impaired, and we cover Alameda, Solano, and Contra Costa counties. Um, our mission is to preserve vision, foster independence, enhance the quality of life for adults who are blind or at risk of vision, vision impairments, and we also serve as a trusted source of information for the community. And we've um, been around for 67 years, we're currently led by our executive director, my boss, Dr. Yolanda Braxton, and our board president is Charles Duke Dunham, who's with the Lions Clubs. Um, we do uh, serve uh, clients in many ways. Um, we have uh, different service lines that are outlined here on the screen here. 
One is um, early detection, and that's eye screenings. Usually that's at senior um, housing projects, low-income housing typically, where we'll um, hold free eye screens for all the residents there um, to try to find early signs of um, common eye diseases and then help the person to get the care they might need. Um, a second service line, vision health outreach, that's a meeting with clients or potential clients to talk about how we can help them. And we also have someone that will go out to the home if needed and um, look around to give advice on um, devices that might help, training that might help, or um, other services that might help. We have orientation and mobility, which is, uh, again, training. And that's for white cane training to move about um, in someone's home or about their neighborhood. We have activities, classes, and events. And that's what I do. Um, that's my department, really. And we try to um, get people together to interact, to learn, to grow, and to um, serve the community. We also have support groups where we, um, um, our clients will get together to talk amongst each other and share ideas and um, support one another. We do all of that and all of our services are free. Um, we, uh, encourage anyone who needs help to give us a call. Um, even if you're out of the area, we'll, we can refer you to the uh, right other agencies that can serve, or even if you're underage, if you're not a senior, we will help you, so give us a call. Um, we do um, provide the information to the community as much as we can, so tell people to call us. Uh, we do refer to other providers, too, in the community, so when we can't help, like maybe it's a food issue or a housing issue, then we try to refer to other providers in the agency that we know of. And we welcome referrals from the community, so all of your faith communities or anyone in your family, anyone that you know that might um, need some help with their vision or have questions, um, please refer them to us. We are available and try to make ourselves available as much as we can. Uh, we have our phone numbers that are listed here, 800-750-EYES, -E -E which is seven, uh, sorry, 3937, or 925-432-3013. Those are our main phone numbers, and that's our office here in Pittsburgh. And that's where our center is. You know, uh, we've been doing a lot uh, lately, as you might guess, uh, virtually. But we are um, getting back into um, in-person activities, which we'll do weekly, and we have outings happening already. So welcome any questions, if anyone has. Can you please put the uh, information again? Because I, I wanted to write it down. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, phone, I'll, put, I'll, put it, I'll put it in the chat room. I'll put okay, it in the chat okay, room. So I appreciate that, right Well, there. Thank you. Richard, I have a question. Do you have any uh, use for um, used eyeglasses? I know there's some places that um, collect them. Yes, we do. Um, we don't uh, do that directly, but we have connections with the Alliance um, group people that do that. So we collect them on behalf of them. And when we get a, a big enough bunch, uh, we bring it to their warehouse for the processing there. So you're welcome to um, donate used glasses. We make use of those through the Lions clubs. Thank you. Uh -huh. Oh, I should say that in your agenda, our, our um, organization name was misspelled. So it's lions, like, like lions clubs, which is about animal lions, um, instead of L-Y-O-N-S. And um, that's my mistake. So sorry uh -huh. about that, Richard. No problem. You know, we used to be called um, the Lions Blind Center, and we used to get calls people asking for window coverings. <laughs> so uh, we're used to uh, lions. That's the first time I've seen it uh, um, spelled that way, but yeah. <laughs> oh, one more question. So if uh, you're saying uh, you have operations in three different counties, um, does that mean they have local presence or how does it work? Um, we. 
we actually mm-hmm. don't have much local presence in the in, um, outside of Contra Costa because that's where where our center is uh, physically located. We're in Pittsburgh, so but we uh, we are serving those areas. So we do it through um, phone. We do it through um, driving there, making visits to the people there. But we don't have as of yet. Uh, we don't have any things going on actually in the counties except for excursions. So this eye clinic is free for everyone, or it is uh, yeah, people without not, insurance? Um, uh, we are not an eye clinic uh, per se. We don't do um, eye exams um, except for the uh, screenings. Um, okay. And um, I'm sorry, I just kind of lost the second part of what was your question. Like uh, I said, oh, uh, is it free? Yes, I mean, it, it is, is for everyone. It's for uh-huh. everyone. Anybody it is free come. for anyone. Yeah, we don't okay. look at income even. No. Okay. Uh-huh. I can refer to people. I know so many people who wants to have their eye screening done. So that's why. I'm okay. Asking. Yeah, an eye screening um, we can do for, <laughs> um, yeah, we can do for people of, you know, even if their eyes are good, we, we'll do eye screenings. Okay. So we can arrange those. Yeah. Please Thank uh, you. contact me and then I can kind of help uh, arrange that. Thank you. Nice to know. Thanks. Uh-huh. Well, Richard, thank you so much for the work you continue to do in, in our community and beyond. And thanks for being here to let us know more about it. You're certainly welcome. And again, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and um, uh, hope all of you will uh, give us a call sometime. Also, just like you alluded to with your organization, we also are trying to dip our toes back into the water of meeting in person again. And so that is going to be our next uh, elected council meeting on June 9th. Uh, We are going to have our first in-person meeting uh, that will be quarterly. Um, And that's at Hillcrest UCC Fellowship. But you should remember, we should all remember to check our emails because as we are still dealing with the COVID pandemic, there may be surges, et cetera, that cause us to have to change course again. Something that I (laughs) hate that we are all used to now, but we are all very accustomed to shifting course very quickly in terms of meeting in person (laughs) or online and the various things we do in our lives. So just uh, keep an eye out on that, but know that we are we are making strides to see if we can shift ourselves back to in-person uh, fellowship. And now I am excited to ask Terry Moss to give us an update on eye care and all of the really cool things happening with that program. Thank you, Rodney. And it's so good to see you back and to see everybody this morning. I'm going to um, be sort of the moderator of some uh, of what's going on with eye care. We've got some very exciting changes going on. And we also want to let you know about all the or things that we've been doing up to this point. Um, I'd like to start by introducing our eye care team. We've got some new members. Um, and I'd like each of them uh, to say a few words about why they chose to join the eye care team. And, uh, and then I, um, and then we will move on to talk about what we've done up to this point and upcoming projects. I put in the chat, the link to our sign up genius, which is the go-to place for all projects, uh, current and future. That's constantly changing. Um, Before I introduce the members of our eye care team, I'd just like to give a huge shout out to Charlotte and to uh, um, Charlotte Ginn in the um, eye care uh, office and also to Anita Weil, who are our back room, which doesn't sound quite right, um, support team for keeping our, um, you know, uh, Charlotte's doing outreach to all of our faith communities to remind them and to let them know about projects. And then Anita keeps our sign up genius, um, a genius. So with that, I'd like to, and of course, Dave Longhurst and I are co-chairs of iCare. And Dave is a huge energy and presence to be, uh, I wouldn't say dealt with, but to admire, at least I do. He has endless energy and I can't believe he doesn't 
drink coffee. Anyway, um, the new <laughs> members of our uh, of our team are Nazli Sajad, and I apologize if I said your last name wrong. No, it was fine. <laughs> uh, Ginny, Ali, Sarah, Brett Hauer, and Rebecca Seaman. So let's start with you, Nazli, if you'd like to speak for um, you know a minute or so about, we have a lot okay. to cover, it's why you joined Eye Care. Uh, I did a project with them through our center. Uh, it was a backpack. We made backpacks for refugees, refugee kids, Afghan refugee kids. And I thought it was, it was an amazing program. And um, now we are doing another project. I'm really into it. And so it's it's nice to know other faith. I, I really, that's the thing I like too. I, I'm learning a lot about other faith and people are very, very nice, very nice. <laughs> Thank you, Nazli. Um, and uh, and Jenny Ali, are you here? Yeah, there you are. Sorry, I was muted again. No problem. All right, I lost myself, lost my screen earlier. I apologize for that. No problem. Um, I'm <clears throat> Jenny Ali, uh, representing the Baha'i Faith of Walnut Creek. And um, previous to being on the elected council and joining the Eye Care Committee, I worked with the Walnut Creek area, newcomers and near neighbors club for the last seven years. And I was active in their community outreach. So we worked with Trinity Center and Monument Crisis Center, the uh, Bay Area Crisis Nursery, St. Vincent de Paul, Winter Nights. And um, we did what we could with, um, with the homeless and those in need. Uh, why am I on the eye care committee? because I care about humanity and peace and unity and justice. I believe it starts with each person's journey towards spirituality and expands exponentially outward towards other well-wishers of humanity for the betterment of the world and for the sake of God. I believe one person with good intentions can make a positive difference in the community we all share with unity of thought, will, and action. It's my moral imperative to help make our community kinder and all-inclusive by providing service to meet the needs of all the sectors of our county and to get to know and love the people of all religious faith. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Um, if I could just break in while I'm thinking of this. You mentioned all the work that you did or you've done in your community. And I'll add that all of our faith communities share this value of um, helping those in need. And many of our, if not all of our faith communities work with many of the nonprofits that we work with in eye care. The big thing that makes eye care different is that you're rather than doing it just with your faith community, you're joining others and in other faith communities. And that gives you this unique opportunity to meet people, plan projects together, work together with people that you would not have otherwise met perhaps. And you learn about their faith traditions and you learn as much or more about your own because they ask you questions that you usually can't answer. And I had that experience with Dave at our Passover Seder when he asked, why Elijah? And I said, I don't know, because that's what we always do. And that forced a Google search. So anyway, <laughs> um, just to say that that's what is so unique and wonderful about eye care. And I'm hoping that by you hearing everybody's story and hearing more about what we do, that you will go back to your faith communities and get very excited about looking for ways to co-sponsor projects. That's my not so hidden agenda. Sarah. Well, you said it all really well. Um, so thank you. That was just perfect about all the different faiths and not knowing all the answers when people ask questions because you just do it. Um, and that is so true. But um, how I got, I, I'm Sarah and my last name's Brett Hauer. And Terry got it right. And um, some people have, it is kind of challenging. Um, and I'm with Peace Lutheran in Danville. And um, I was asked to help with the Mother's Day hygiene kits uh, about, I don't know, maybe, I, I can't remember. How long was it ago? Two years ago when I first yeah. met you, Terry? Yep, the beginning of the pandemic, why not? Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Right. Okay. So that was really good when we had um, uh, Temple Isaiah, uh, Peace Lutheran, um, Hindu community. I think it was just the three interfaith groups that got together. And it was really fun to get to know everybody and work as a team and brainstorm on how to do it best and all the thought process and learn um, different project management skills um, as well as interfaith skills. And that was great. And then uh, I was asked to, we were asked to do another project and another one together. And and then the last one was with, and uh, forgive me if I say your name incorrectly, Babak. Is it Babak? How do you say your name <laughs> properly? Is that right? Um, so uh, Babak joined our, our threesome um, and the Baha'i faith became our, our fourth one that worked on the last project. and. It was for breakfast kits. And um, so we went shopping at Costco together and it was fun. And um, since then I've done some things on the side with my new friends, um, like Holy, I was invited to do the Holy when you do all the colorful um, powder and celebrate that. And I've had walks with individuals and hikes and I've seen Babak at um, an Easter service at our church. So it's just been really fun to, get to know people I, like Terry said, I wouldn't normally have gotten to know. So I'm very happy to be part of this. Thanks. And I look forward to future ones. Thank you, Sarah. And I'll just interject that um, thanks to our connections, I got to know Anshu, who is with the Hindu community and um, she's loaning me a sari oh. so that I can <laughs> wear it at an Indian Jewish wedding that I'm going to in <laughs> Chicago. How cool is that? It's so sweet. Anyway, uh, Rebecca, are you here? Rebecca Seema? Rebecca's ill today. She's not here. She's okay. ill, unfortunately. It's, and we can pray for Ben Jones as well. He's also ill. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. Rebecca is also a powerhouse in our eye care team and has been around for a while. I'll just mention before I... Um, turn it over to Dave, that we have a project coming up on May 15th. Um, it's a, an honoring our second annual Honoring Moms project uh, for the Monument Crisis Center, putting together hygiene kits and putting together diapers and wipes for um, moms and their babies at, for the Monument Crisis Center. And the, the um, co-sponsors for that are Naomi um, Ehrlich of uh, Beth Chaim, Nasli at the Pleasanton Islamic Center, and Diane Maltester of First Christian Church. And then Rodney is also going to be doing a part as part of his church service. Maybe you could tell us for this project or future. Yeah, sure. So this Sunday, we're uh, happy to, to give a, a worship service surrounding our economic food and housing justice ministry team. And part of it was uh, creating a ritual of community and caring where in the service, we are going to ask people to write notes of support and hope and encouragement to the women of the Monument Crisis Center. And we'll be collecting those as part of our worship service and then delivering those to the eye care office for use in various hygiene kits, et cetera. For those of you who in your faith tradition do rituals within your worship service or in small breakouts, I'm happy to send a copy of that and you can make it your own um, if you're interested. But it is a wonderful way for us to support the work of eye care and and hopefully get the word out to my faith community that that they could have a more interactive uh, opportunity next time with an eye care opportunity in person so that they get the rich, amazing ability of cross faith dialogue, which is so important. Thanks, Rodney. And I understand that B'nai Shalom Walnut uh, Creek is also involved in this eye care project. So with I have, that, I have, can I ask you a question? Sure. Is there any way to get a list of those projects that you're considering you're going to do further in advance? It's very hard for me to go to my group now and say, today is the 11th, 15th, you're going to do this project. It's too short. Oh, no, absolutely. That's a good, great question. Um, so what the way it works is that you we have projects that are in the um, that we have in sign up genius and that we have on our sign up genius that we keep current. And um, I, I put that link in um, and here it is again uh, in the chat. And um, you can always check on the sign up genius uh, and um, and sorry, you can always 
look at Sign Up Genius for future projects. We also send out an e-blast every month that gives current projects that are looking for congregational or faith community co-sponsorship. And the way it works is that we generally need at least two co-sponsors to uh, for a project, and then it's opened up to uh, vo all volunteers. Uh, uh, you know, anyone that, who could. That's the them. kind of thing I was looking for, but I've never had. I've never had an announcement. I've never. Yes, seen it's it. in our. I, it's in two places. It's in our monthly report inside all yeah. of our agendas, and oh, it's okay. also online on it's, our program right. link. And when when uh, uh, Wilson Interfaith Council interfaithccc.org. And when Will sends out the monthly um, interfaith, count, interfaith Council um, e-blast of what's going on throughout the organization, eye care is listed. We also have a specific eye care e-blast that talks about current and future projects that need volunteers. And then you can also go to our Sign Up Genius at that link um, where we keep it current on what we need. So Dave, you want to try to... We try to send the eye care e blast near the first of the month. Yeah. Terry, how do they sign up for the e email blast? Uh, on every, the everyone on our list gets it already. Oh. Yeah. You, you should already be signed up. I get it. I wasn't sure if anybody else. <laughs> I mean, how that. If you're works. not getting it, look in your spam folder. Okay. Uh, so, Dave, would you like to take us through um, what eye care has done over the last 20 months? Happy to do that. Thank you, Terry, for um, for all your good words and everyone else who's participated. Reverend Will, could you bring up the presentation now? Um, I put together a short PowerPoint presentation with the objective of looking back over the last uh, 20 months. You know, we started 20 months ago and looking at the good that we as a group and, and you particularly for the for so many of you have been involved in this that has made this successful. Uh, next slide. So for the breadth of volunteers in the past 20 months, we've had 60 sponsoring organizations representing 31 faith communities that basically 31 different faith communities have participated, but, but on average, each faith community has volunteered twice. So that's how we get to the 60, it's, it's every sponsor. And we've had 28 different service projects. Next slide. Uh, and we've, over that 20 month period, we've had a, th a thousand volunteers participating in eye care service, over a thousand. I, we, we don't get, get exact numbers, but that's our, our estimate. Over $70,000 was donated both in goods and in, uh, in cash. And we benefited 10 either nonprofit or government agencies in the in Contra Costa County, County. And many of these nonprofits, we've done several, like Terry mentioned, non, the Monument Crisis Center. I think we've had like eight, seven projects at Monument Crisis Center. So um, a lot of these organizations just so appreciate the, the work that we've done. This is a look at the, the types of service projects we've done. Total of 28 projects here, and this, this uh, outlines it, food drives. 2,100 food kits distributed. I mean, that's just, just amazes me. 4,350 hygiene kits that benefited people, you know, with shampoo and soap and other uh, basic needs. Five bud drives for 182 units of blood. We did, we've done mock interviews at Opportunity Junction where there's these job seekers that need to practice their interview skills. That's, that's been a wonderful uh, project. Uh, backpack drive, Nosley mentioned the backtrack back drive that they, they sponsored. And then we did one uh, grounds cleanup. We're planning to do more of these kind of grounds cleanup, which will not cost any money generally. And uh, we can get a lots of volunteers to be involved. So just a big thank you for everyone for your support and for really making a difference in our community. Um, so that was the look back. I think now Terry's gonna take it and look forward just a little bit for some of the things we're, we're, we've been at least on our agenda and thinking about. Thank you, Dave. And, and please jump in if I forget something since you're so involved with so many of these, you know, getting these projects up and running. It's our goal to have three, you know, to have at least the next three months covered with projects for you. We like to do a minimum of one project a month, but if something else comes up, we will do that. We'll, we'll offer that. We're also looking for projects that, that um, faith communities of all sizes and financial ability can can support. Um, some don't have require any fundraising. Um, some require 
working with their partners to raise funds for the hygiene kits and food, et cetera. So what we have coming up are, um, well, we have this thing coming up on Sunday and I just wanted to let you know that that's happening, not that we need volunteers. Uh, we also have a Trinity Center uh, preparing meals and serving them. Um, that has our, that already has volunteers, but we will hopefully do more of that. Um, so look for that. Um, we have some Contra Costa area cleanup opportunities. This is with, uh, I think, Walnut Creek and Antioch, but please help me if I'm, and maybe Concord. Yeah, I think the, the first cleanup opportunity is the sort of to Walnut Creek, Lafayette, Alamo area, this cleanup crew that uh, it's kind of a grassroots organization and we thought we would support them. It's got like a two to three hours on a Saturday. And then we're also thinking about one in, in Antioch probably for the fall. Right, and that's a good one just because I don't know that it, I mean, it would be nice to have faith communities partner so that you can have that opportunity to work together on it. Um, we're still fleshing that out. We're looking at the food bank of Contra Costa County in the future. Um, so we're trying to expand our horizons uh, with other nonprofits to work with. White Pony has always been a great organization to team up with. Um, and then we're also exploring the possibility of a new um, uh, work, uh, work group that is wanting to deliver um, meals, prepare and deliver meals to people without homes on the weekends. Trinity Center carry, covers um, that obligation. Uh, and need tries to meet that need Monday through Friday, but the weekends are um, not being met. Uh, those needs aren't being met, but that's still in process. So we have a lot of things in process. Uh, part of what our eye care team is doing is looking for opportunities. We have two thing, things that we're always doing, looking for opportunities to serve, filling up our calendar down the road so that you can have be able to plan, and then also doing outreach to our faith communities to say, please step up and participate. Um, we can't be everywhere. We, we have very thin funding. So if your role, I'm, I'm imploring you to represent your faith communities and go back and ask them to participate and tell them about eye care and make it a regular thing to go and look on the eye care um, sign up genius. Okay, that's it. Can I just mention that, Dave, that would be wonderful to send out the summary that you gave to all of us so that we can use that to um, encourage our faith communities to participate and also generate some new ideas. Great idea. I'll, I'll, I'll push it out to Reverend Will. Maybe he can push it out to the group. Thank you. So um, inside all of our agendas each month, there are different um, uh, reports, and most of them we don't get to talk about. So we really um, encourage you to look at all of the reports, um, including the eye care. There's an eye change report. There's the chaplaincy report. There's our development report, and there's all of my reports. We only have time to have one group give a verbal report each month, so we really re uh, rely on you reading through those reports. And there's usually all of the same in-depth information about upcoming eye care events inside that. Rodney. Great. Well, before we break into our uh, small breakout group discussions, I would like to invite uh, Robert, uh, Robert, I'm so sorry, Robin, Robin Mencher, uh, who is the new CEO of the Jewish Family uh, and Community uh, Center here to give us a little presentation to kind of set our hearts and minds toward our question today. I've lost you, Robin, but I saw you. You were here. Good morning, everyone. I'm right here, and uh, I'm just going to uh, put my contact information in the chat and uh, go ahead and share my screen. Little logistics here. Um, that's not the right screen. Hold on. Oh, we've all been there. Okay, let's try again. Huh, still not working. We just, we're going to try one more time. Share screen. Let's try this one. Also, hold on. Little technical difficulties. I'm going to try to resolve it. And then if I can, that'll be great. We could see that. We could see that, Robin. 
You can see exactly. where it says our values. Yep. Huh. Okay. Funny. Oh, and then it just went away into a DocuSign. Your session is. Oh, my goodness. So I think your All right. tab, you need to go I'm back to the first back. tab. On Hold on. Um, I am not seeing that. the same thing you are. Get, uh, I haven't had this challenge before, but we're going to figure it out um, without taking too much more time here. Thank you for your patience. And let's try one more time. Are you seeing now uh, the JFCS yes. East Bay welcoming new neighbors sign? Yes. yes. Yep. Wonderful. Thank you for your patience, everyone. Uh, I'm Robin Mencher from Jewish Family Community Services East Bay, and I am thrilled uh, to be with you all this morning. I want to thank Reverend Will for uh, inviting, uh, I assume, inviting us back that over JFCS East Bay's 145 year history, we've probably presented to this group and uh, in partnership with you all in the past. Uh, I also want to uh, thank um, all of the community members present and congregational leaders who have in the past or who are currently or who are thinking about partnering with us and with other refugee serving organizations uh, here in Contra Costa County to really uh, do what this note says, which is welcome new neighbors into the East Bay. I'm going to just take a few minutes to tell you a little bit about uh, our motivation for being a refugee resettlement agency for 145 years, among many other social and human services that we offer to members of the East Bay community. Um, some of you probably know this information well enough that you could be giving the presentation. And for others, uh, you might be hearing this for uh, the first or second time. So any questions are welcomed. I just wanna give you a tiny taste of who we are and how we work and where we see the work going as a catalyst for you to engage in small group dialogues with one another. Um, and for us to continue this dialogue throughout uh, going forward. Does that sound good to everyone? Yep, okay, great. So uh, we are gathered uh, in this uh, council uh, because we have some shared values about uh, investing in community. And I just wanted to briefly highlight JFCS East Bay's values. We're a organization that serves everyone in the East Bay. Uh, we're founded within the Jewish community uh, by a group of women in the late 1800s in Oakland uh, at a local congregation. Uh, that said, well, our relatives are coming over from the old country, uh, we better get ready and we better be ready to welcome them with dignity and care. And that's how the work started. And that's the foundation of how that work continues. Uh, these five values uh, are the ones that motivate and drive us uh, every day in the work that we do. Our staff uh, is as diverse as the East Bay and the clients we serve and the community partners we engage with is as diverse and as wonderful as the whole East Bay. Uh, and our motivations are founded on these ideas, um, which while they uh, are rooted in Jewish tradition, certainly cross uh, many faith and denominational lines. Uh, and so we come to you this morning and shared sp spirit and fellowship. Uh, I saw in the agenda that Reverend Will sent out a reference to the United Nations uh, recent report about the impact of climate change um, through the end of this century uh, that um, will create uh, ecological and political upheaval that will displace up to 2 billion people by the turn of the next century. I want to call your attention to uh, this resource, an article written by uh, environmentalist Bill McKibben that was recently published in The New Yorker, where he really is looking at uh, the internally and externally displaced people from Ukraine as a result of the current and ongoing war and connects that idea as an opportunity uh, that nobody wants, but since it's here, an opportunity for us to rethink our core assumptions about how we live on this earth and begin to prepare for uh, how climate change uh, will change all of our lives and will displace lots of people. 
Uh, so that's the long run about where we're headed. We've been doing this work for uh, for quite some time, and we've been uh, resettling refugees through many different generations and movements of uh, people in large groups and small groups uh, who seek a new life, who seek an opportunity to restart uh, with safety and dignity, and who seek to reunite with their family. Many uh, people who have family members in the East Bay, it's exactly why they come here as opposed to anywhere else on the globe. So just a note about what a refugee resettlement agency does. Uh, for those of you who may not be so familiar, we are in that mass migration of people, uh, whether coming through our Southern border seeking asylum or uh, holders of a special immigrant visa because they worked with the US military in Afghanistan uh, or um, uh, being eligible for refugee status because uh, they are displaced from their homeland in some way as noted by the United Nations. The United States uh, in fits and starts and waves uh, welcomes refugees and other immigrants to go through a very specific process of resettlement. And our local resettlement agencies like JFCS East Bay, which is one uh, of two main ones in the East Bay that do refugee resettlement. The other one is uh, IRC or International Rescue Committee. And our uh, Jewish Family Services of Silicon Valley also touches the tip, the Southern tip of Alameda County in East Bay resettlement as well. Uh, we follow a process that's dictated by the Office of Refugee Resettlement of the US government. And these are the steps that we go through. Um, planning in advance for a new arrival to come. We do this work uh, as an affiliate of HIAS, uh, an international humanitarian organization that uh, is one of nine agencies that, that works with the US government on refugee resettlement. And we are one of, I think, 26 or 27 affiliates around the country. There are three of us in California, ourselves, Silicon Valley, and San Diego. And so the process outlined here is pretty simple. We prepare and plan, and then our case managers meets that uh, new family, newly arriving family at the airport. And then it's a scripted process about what happens during the first 30 days and the first 90 days. And then once a family arrives and is connected with us. Uh, they may not be an active client, but they stay connected with us for as long as they choose. What you see outlined here is the requirements from the government. What JFCS East Bay and other resettlement agencies do is look at this set of requirements as the floor. And then we partner with your congregations with uh, our counties and cities with community-based and civic organizations to fill in, and individual volunteers, to fill in everything uh, that is needed for people to start their lives with safety, security, stability, and self-sufficiency uh, so that they can be engaged, uh, positive members of our East Bay community. So that's everything from connecting folks to community-based organizations that uh, is a community that they wanna be a part of. Um, uh, and in the case of our Afghan new arrivals, really working with the established Afghan community in the East Bay, which is why so many people are coming here. It means partnering with volunteers and faith-based organizations uh, on everything from uh, furnishing uh, apartments with goods and getting the materials in the apartment to supporting folks with uh, English language services, with cultural orientations, with access um, to a whole host of community services. Uh, and it means doing a lot of listening and connecting. So we're not only the first point of connection for the new arrivals, we also see ourselves as a catalyst and a connector uh, so that uh, our new arrivals can build roots in their new community. Uh, 
this is the work that we have taken on and it's driven by the values that I just shared with you. And uh, when we hit these moments, like whatever will unfold with Ukraine and what is continuing to unfold and will be for the next several years with evacuations from Afghanistan, we have to remember that this work happens successfully when we have community partnerships and we all have a role to play. And uh, at JFCS East Bay, we're inspired not only by what's happening uh, in the world today and what we're planning for, but in our own history and heritage. Uh, so I brought uh, this uh, quote, which is uh, just a couple of, uh, of millennium old uh, to remind us that we all have a role to play. Um, and so I offer that up to you for uh, some inspiration. And I'm happy to uh, take some questions if you wanna know about some more of the details about how we do our work, how people can get involved or share a story about how your congregation um, has partnered with us to do this work. Robin, uh, I think we, um, let's do some questions here in the large group since we're a smaller number than normal. And let's, um, uh, we've got one in the chat room here. How do organizations volunteer to assist with JCFS from Reverend Rodney? Great. Um, so uh, the easiest thing to do if your uh, organization or congregation wants to get involved, there are a variety of opportunities. Um, uh, if you head on over to our website, there's a, in the upper right hand corner, there's um, a section that says uh, volunteer and or get involved and when you go there there's a form that you can fill out and it goes directly to our volunteer services team uh, and they call through that information on a weekly basis uh, individuals or groups can uh, do a variety of things um, one they can work with refugee resettlement or any of our other social and human service programs um, to be the conduit between uh, our clients and the broader community. That could be anything from donating your time, uh, donating goods, uh, everything from a dining room table to a Chromebook to shampoo and conditioner uh, are all the kinds of uh, supplies that uh, we take and we keep a running wish list available. Um, and also donating funds uh, to um, bridge the gap between the uh, very limited amount of money that comes from the US government and what it actually takes to live in the East Bay. People come to the East Bay because their family is here and they wanna reunite with them and there's opportunity here. But we also know that uh, housing affordability and availability is at a premium, if not a complete crisis here. And that means that when a family comes and we support them to uh, secure an apartment and move them in. Uh, the funds that come from the federal government with their resettlement process uh, does not cover uh, the needs for rent. And so we fundraise for that specifically for direct assistance and rental subsidies. Uh, for are the, groups, uh, Robin, yeah. are, Robin, are there times that you um, uh, run out of room for furniture or uh, d everything just happens through your website then, right? Yeah. So uh, with the large number of new arrivals from Afghanistan, we've resettled almost 600 people since September, just from mm -hmm. Afghanistan. Uh, we've rented additional storage units. We've uh, moved things around and, um, and we're, we're keeping things together. What uh, the volunteer services team does is they keep a solid inventory. And so they take when they have need and when they have space for it. Um, one other thing that I want to mention <clears throat> is uh, we have something called community welcome teams, which is if you have a group of folks in your congregation or your organization that want to work together uh, to partner with a case manager and supporting a newly arrived family for several months at a time uh, to provide any number of services, whether that's uh, support for English language acquisition, uh, transportation, uh, uh, connecting to community resources, um, and many other support services. 
um, your team can sign up with JFCS East Bay. We have a person in charge of that project and then uh, go through an orientation uh, and uh, register with us and make a commitment to work with a case manager and a, a family that's been recommended uh, to participate in the program. We have about 20, 25 of those groups running right now. Great, and and you know the we're coming into compliance with AB 506 right now as well. And I'm sure that you're probably doing that and making sure that you're doing all, making sure that you have all the background checks for volunteers and all, all of our congregations need to, to be um, thinking about how do they get in compliance with this? Cause it's a, uh, it, it demands a live scan and it demands um, uh, additional uh, training around recognizing the signs around child abuse and human trafficking, in addition to the sexual misconduct trainings that all nonprofits have to do. So how are you um, doing volunteer management? Uh, or are you relying on the congregations to do that for their teams? Or how are you doing that for folks? Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, our volunteer uh, management with our uh, refugee services is actually um, coordinated with really specific guidelines from our national resettlement agency, HIAS. Uh, and so we have uh, pretty strict and clear protocols about how all of that works. And so there is um, an, not only an orientation, but a screening uh, and paperwork and a contract that, that comes together. Uh, a contract is probably not quite the right word, but um, a, a commitment of roles and responsibilities. Co covenant. Covenant? Uh, so, yes, similar to that, yes. Agreement. Okay, we have, there we go. We have some other questions here too. Um, uh, one person celebrating that you were able to bring folks from Afghanistan together with Heather Farms, but also um, understanding that are there life skill courses that they can access like financial literacy, avoiding scams, things like that. Right, so I think there's also another question around what happens after those first 90 days, right? So what you saw on that slide was that for families where um, they are, it's so obvious that they're gonna need more intensive ongoing case management, usually because there's a significant health issue involved. Uh, we have a whole separate program that supports uh, those families who really need specific additional assistance for physical and or mental health. Uh, and because we have such a huge influx of uh, new arrivals from Afghanistan all at the same time, uh, we are seeing community-based organizations and uh, uh, civic and state organizations step up to weave together a network of support for, specifically for uh, Afghan families to support that acculturation. And so we do, we are required to do a basic cultural orientation. And then what we do is we connect folks to a variety of services that are offered by our partner providers. Um, this summer and fall, uh, when the evacuation began, um, folks in Alameda County and in Contra Costa County at the county level and at the community-based organization level quickly began to organize and meet, uh, utilizing in some cases already established uh, groups around uh, refugee and there's an East Bay Refugee and Immigrant Forum uh, and began to organize ourselves in working groups specifically to address Afghan uh, issues and, uh, and begin to create uh, access points and pathways to linguistically and culturally responsive opportunities for growing um, skills for acculturation and for employment development. And, and most of the folks that get that. assigned, most of the folks that get assigned to you, are they assigned to you by the State Department or how do they divvy them up between you and IRC and I know, uh, is Catholic Charities going to be coming back into the mix? Or are they going to be rebuilding their capacity? Um, I'm not quite sure what their plans are. We haven't heard that they're coming back online for refugee resettlement, but what happens uh, is uh, the Office of Refugee Resettlement uh, disperses newly arrived refugees for resettlement or refugee is a general term uh, for a bunch of different legal classes of folks who, have, who are eligible for benefits and for resettlement services. 
they distribute them across the nine resettlement agencies uh, that have contracts with the US government. So we're affiliated with one called HIAS, uh, which used to be known as the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. And IRC are local chapters of the International Rescue Committee. So the government decides uh, where each family will get placed among those nine uh, international or national organizations. And then those central offices in Washington, D.C. typically then uh, uh, look through that case and identify where uh, a new arrival has a community point of connection. That is called a U.S. tie. So where geographically is that person who is the relative or the friend who has raised their hand and said, when this person comes, I will be ready to receive them. Uh, anyone who comes through HIAS who has a US tie in Alameda or Contra Costa County is assigned to us. With Afghans and sometimes with folks from other countries, uh, people may find their way here through a different route. Um, there's a huge percentage of people who left Afghanistan who were not airlifted in that week of dramatic uh, images that you saw of the airplanes that reminded us of Vietnam. Uh, they came because their US tie bought them a plane ticket and they got out uh, to Pakistan and then flew out here or any number of other stories. Or they did get airlifted out and when they in some on some flight and when they arrived at a US airport, uh, somebody said to them, do you wanna to go to the military base to uh, wait until and get all your paperwork processed? And if they said yes, they went and then they continued down that pathway. And if they said, no, my cousin sent me a plane ticket uh, to fly to Oakland, I have it right here, uh, I'm gonna do that. Then they came to Oakland uh, and found their way to Concord to their uh, relative's house, and they never got registered through the system. So there are actually thousands of people in California who are in that category, who they're, um, they are now coming in as our, uh, as our clients, and we're trying to catch all those folks who didn't come through the regular channels. For uh, new arrivals from Afghanistan, just so you know, we're in year one of what the US State Department is assuming is a five-year plan for refugee resettlement. Um, specifically people from Afghanistan. Just, that's all, just Afghanistan. Yeah, so we're in, if just, wow. well, we're also receiving refugees from many other countries uh, and we're preparing to, uh, receive some new, a handful of new arrivals from Ukraine. We know that uh, the for the for what we can see in the future, uh, community members coming from Afghanistan will continue to be our largest population for resettlement here in the East Bay because the East Bay is one of the largest Afghan community established Afghan communities in the U.S. Here in Contra Costa, in folks are resettled in Concord, uh, the eastern part of Contra Costa County, Antioch, and, and so on. Uh, and that's really about both where the established community is and also uh, where we can find apartments that are approaching uh, affordability. Wow, Robin, thank you so much. Thanks. We want to open it up for our broader conversation and um, no, Celia, uh, we, we're tight on time. Can you put it in the chat room? Because we want to be able to get to these questions. Of what is your faith community doing for the world's refugees right now? What do you think I4C should be doing for the refugee situation? And then the UN has studied refugee issues for the future and estimate that there could be up to 2 billion ecological refugees by the year 2100. What should we be doing now to prepare for that potential future? spiritual preparation, physical preparation systems to address disaster. So I want to so, thank you all uh, for inviting JFCS East Bay to be present this morning. And uh, as I say goodbye, and uh, you all uh, go off into the conversations, which are really at the heart of this, I also just want to uh, share my screen one more time to remind us all that while I can talk about the numbers and the flight paths, 
that we're really talking about people, individuals and family members who are coming here uh, for a new start and a safer future. Uh, this is a picture. This uh, gentleman on the left is actually one of our refugee resettlement case managers who was resettled by our agency a couple of years ago in, um, from Syria um, when he uh, fled the war. Um, so, and with that, I just want to uh, express gratitude uh, for inviting us here today um, and look forward to continuing this connection. Take care. Thank you, Robin. Yeah. And also shameless plug, I just went to the website and signed up. It's super easy. So if you're interested, I highly recommend that you try that yourself. Thank you, Robin. And anything for the last 10 minutes, if we can uh, try to address these questions that we had that we were going to do in our breakout rooms, but now we didn't have time for, uh, is there any broader conversation that you all would like to have about those questions? What is your faith community doing for refugees right now? What should we be doing? How should we be looking to the future? Well, I'm a sponsor with JFCS with my church group and we have a family of 10 in uh, Concord and um, it involves like a lot of driving to doctor appointments and um, helping with paperwork, um, helping navigate the new country, um, just uh, helping organization. I brought over a calendar yesterday that they can put on the board and um, just keep track of everything that's going on in their life because it's just a lot to handle, um, people coming and going. and. Um, I have a volunteer team that is just starting to be vetted and I have more help now. And so um, they're driving appointments. Like yesterday I had one person driving one person to an appointment and I have drove an, um, another person to another appointment. And so it's, um, it's been um, really fulfilling for me too. And I know that they do appreciate it. The mother is pregnant and due like in a week. And so I've been securing um, Car seats, uh, baby clothes, Jenny offered a lot. Um, culturally, I think they want some new things for the new baby. I think that has appeared, but um, they I've been getting a lot of used items through next door, uh, like crib that, that are safe and um, you know been approved and car seats and uh, I've gotten a lot of stuff. So it's been really a nice to have a generous community and they are appreciative and um, I think they feel confident and comfortable to ask me questions and I, I have like a new, the kids have called me their second mommy. So <laughs> it's been very fulfilling and nice and I um, enriched my life. We also distributed uh, toys to refugee kids on, um, uh, on Eid. So we had all these refugee Afghan kids and they were really happy. We did a toy drive at our center and we did that. And we are, at, as of all the Muslim um, centers are helping Afghan refugees, distributing food, you know, it's not the only one Muslim center, all of them are doing, they're settling them, you know, there are lots of um, Afghan refugees right now. So everybody's pitching in, doing their part. <laughs> That's, I think. San Ramon Valley Islamic Center and Muslim Community Center uh, in Pleasanton are both uh, re sponsoring refugees. And uh, it is through the Jewish, Jewish uh, organization and they are settling them in and they ask us for funds. And we, you know, they, 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 they put a whole house together, everything together to get them there. They had to arrange for people to uh, pick them up from airports and other places to bring them yeah. to where they need to be. Yes. They arrange for housing for them. And uh, also they arrange for, you know, uh, for English language classes for them. Like, you know, they have volunteers. We go, not me, but personally, but other people go in and teach them English, as, you know, some, some level. And they get them, uh, you know, enrolled in places where they can learn English. And, um, you know, a lots of, lots, uh, lots, since there are a lot of Afghanis here anyway, lots of them have an, uh, have an access to some kind of a job lots of time but not always so you know that that's one thing very helpful you know they can they can they can they have a they have a leg leg in some places you know so they can start working a little bit and so the kids and the mother especially are you know are um, uh, being helped with the language so that they can they can easily communicate and the kids can start school and all that stuff so this is what they're doing 
Thank you, Celia, then Ginny, then uh, Leonard. Okay, so hey. I'll use the services of J Jewish Family Services, and they've been wonderful, except they have a great shortage, I think, of therapists and people to visit and a few other things, which I'm happy to talk about with anybody um, if they want to. Um, I'm extremely grateful to a visitor that comes to see me once a week um, from Family Services. She's absolutely wonderful. And I also wanted to say that I have a very good friend who's an Afghan refugee from the, Germ the Russian days. And he started a charity that works with people in mostly in Turlock and M Modesto. And I was wondering if I could contact Robin about that. That's all, thank you. Um, Robin, I uh, your contact information is in there uh, in the chat room. So uh, Celia, grab her, her contact information from the chat room and please send that information. Yes, Ginny. Uh, yes, I know that there's a new, um, relatively new Islamic center on Treed Boulevard in um, Concord. Uh, Dr. Popal has been the contact. He's a linguist at uh, San Francisco. I don't think we have a representative from that mosque. And uh, we did deliver some hygiene kits to them through the uh, Baha'is of Concord. And uh, they were interested in... Um, having somebody come to the mosque. Um, now it's the summer, so maybe they will have at different times, but they wanted to have someone come and um, work with the middle school children on English because they're having difficulties with their homework. And um, so he's asking for that kind of outreach if anybody's interested in that or yeah, if, I was, if the other mosque could help with that. I was teaching three kids. I was teaching. I was uh, teaching three kids uh, elementary school Afghan refugees. They did not know any English. It was a little bit hard, but you know because they do not understand. <laughs> but I did it for uh, before I went. I I went to visit Pakistan, but uh, I did for four, at least four or five months, and they were getting better. Uh, do you do you work with the Noor? Nor, um, no, this was somebody uh, through, um, I think it was through Islamic Center, San Ramon Islamic Center, I'm not sure. But yes, uh, I do know. I live very close to Noor Masjid. So very, very close, like five minutes away. <laughs> oh, good. I do know them, yes. Uh, good. If, you would if anyone needs their contact information, please let me know. And please, if you'd like to... I have a number for Dr. Popal, if you want, I can give it to you. And also, my friend from Afghanistan, Atta Argandawal, is helping people with learning English, et cetera, and so forth. If you want his contact information, I'm happy to get it, get it to you. Thank you. Great. Anyone else have a, anything to share about our questions? Yes, I, I do. Um, I think this is one of the most valuable things that I foresee can be doing. And that is to have people like Robin, Robin, thank you so much, come in and tell us what uh, um, organizations and what uh, opportunities are already in effect? So, because we don't have to recreate the wheel. Um, there is JFCS, there is um, Freedom for Immigrants, there is um, uh, Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity. Uh, many of you know that I have housed uh, many uh, refugees and asylum seekers in my home while they when they first arrived while they were looking for places and i think it's great that we are sharing ideas about what our own faith communities are doing i think we need to do more of that and i think we need to do more are there any more uh discussion that people want to have on this no, uh, I would like to say, you know, thank Robin, because I have been investigating helping uh, Ukrainian refugees, and I'll tell you, it's a nightmare to try to get any information and going through, and I find now that there's an intermediary right here that we can probably deal with to get the information, so it was a very valuable talk. It saved me probably months of work trying to find my way in through that maze. Great. And, and really, Robin, thank you so much. Thank you for all the work that your organization is doing. And thank you for, for coming and sharing this 
with all of us. I have one question. Um, it, is there anything specific that is planned or can be discussed about how to um, engage the young people of the refugee families so that they also feel like they are coming to a new home and I don't know, maybe it's already been addressed on that website. I haven't looked through it yet, but um, how do we help the young people transition to, I guess is my question. I, 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 have, I, have, I feel like the woman, Afghan woman, that's what I tell them. They need to make a team and do something, you know, they are not doing anything right now. The men are looking for jobs and all that, but the women can do also something. They are not educated. They have an English problem, but we can find something for them to do it at home. I don't know what, but I think, but all the Afghan refugees who are here, they have very young kids. They are, um, I haven't seen, I haven't met any Afghan family who has a little bit older. They are in elementary school, very young, maybe th third, fourth grade. And uh, I, I would like to do something for the women, but I don't know what. I, I, I think they need to work, you know, they need to make money to support their families. But because of lack of education, they really can't get out of the house. And if something we can find for them and they can do at home, that will be really great. I think that will be the best thing we can do for them. And Robin, did you wanna share any answer to that? Yeah. I would just say there are all kinds of uh, initiatives that we're involved in in partnership with local agencies. Uh, like we're hoping to do some work together with First Five uh, in Contra Costa <laughs> County to really support families with young children. And we're in conversation with the Contra Costa County Office of Ed, for instance, um, and some other community groups. We have some resources to really support uh, this. Um, self-sufficiency and cultural integration uh, and supports uh, that's for our new arrivals beyond the 90 days. But really this is where uh, community-based organizations can really step up to, um, to build the kinds of programming. So like the example of partnering with the Nor Islamic Center and working with middle school students, for instance, um, that is really some of the best ways to ensure successful transition for, uh, for our new families, our new neighbors. Thanks so much. And Dr. Erica shared various groups in Fremont, including Six for Humanity are working on collecting cars for new Afghan families. Garages and mechanics are helping fix cars and provide free car services for the new refugees. So that's an important piece too. Um, Ekanatha Pai is gonna give us our closing benediction and faith reflection uh, as we close out our time together today. So Ekanatha, please unmute yourself and thank you so much again, Robin, for all of the work that you do and let us continue to tighten our relationship with your agency as well as all of those helping immigrants. Thank you, gratitude Ekinatha. to you all. Namaste. So, um, what well, wonderful discussions today. Um, so, we have gathered today uh, as uh, interfaith can congregation and collectively spend time together to improve our mutual respect, shared responsibility towards each other, and everyone's well being. Our goal is uh, for the sake of common good, as we um, are closing today. Um, today's session, I take this opportunity to recite some uh, holy uh, texts from Vedas and Upanishads and translate uh, them in English uh, in my own version. Uh, the first, I will recite the prayers and then uh, follow it by uh, the meanings. Om Isha Vasya Midam Sarvam Yat kincha jagat yan jagat, enat yatena hunjita, magrada kasya svidhanam. It means all this, whatever pervades in this universe, is enveloped by God. Enjoy that with a sense of renunciation. Do not covet anyone from this wealth, because this wealth is meant for common good.
ओम पूर्णमद पूर्णमिद पूर्णात्पूर्णमुदच्यते पूर्ण से पूर्णमादाय पूर्णमेवशिष्य मीनिंग इज All that is invisible is part and parcel of this entirety, which we call Brahma. All this visible, manifested world is part and parcel of this entirety. The entire existence was born out of this entirety. When the whole universe is absorbed, all that remains is that alone. another prayer um, that we do right after uh, the uh, performing of puja shuddham medham yasha prajnam vidyam buddhim shriyam balam ayushyam teja arogyam dehi me jagadishwara so the meaning is o lord of the universe please give me faith to conduct well wisdom to understand your presence everywhere success in search of your path understanding the common good sharp intellect to recognize the right path necessary wealth to achieve this goal of oneness internal strength courage power longevity sharpness and good health to attain success in this path i will also recite the shanti mantra the peace chanting om sahana avavatu sahana obhunaktu sah viryam karavavahe tejasvina vadhitam astu ma vidvishavahe om shanti 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 so the meaning is may the lord protect us May the Lord nourish us with knowledge. Let us make efforts and actions for the betterment of all. May we use the knowledge to serve brilliantly and clearly. Let us have no misunderstanding. Om peace be everywhere. Thank you so much Akanatha and Reverend Rodney. Well, it's been wonderful to be with all of you together um in this way. It's been a while for me and I'm very grateful to be back in all of your presence and I hope that we take these benedictions to our hearts and let it light a flame of compassion and empathy in all the works that we do together and in our individual faith movements so i hope you have a wonderful wonderful week and i hope to see everyone at the next elected council meeting which again will be the first at least right now planned in person uh event so have a wonderful wonderful week everyone thank you for joining us you do look familiar thank you so much <laughs>